Welcome to A Look Ahead. As you may already know, we are studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the fourth quarter of 2012. Those are the months of October, November, and December. And it's a series entitled Fundamental Beliefs. This particular lesson is lesson number three, and it's for study on October 20 of 2012, entitled Mankind, God's Handiwork. Before we jump into the lesson, we would like to invite you to join us in a word of prayer. Our kind and loving Father, we're so thankful that we can claim you as our Father. We're thankful for all that the Scripture teaches us about our origins and about what you intended for us. May our study today be helpful in understanding this better and in showing us the high standard which you promise you will help us reach if we are willing to cooperate. May we do more so every day and every week is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. This lesson is about us. Human beings originally made in the very image of God. And what happened that caused many of us to end up being a whole lot more like the image of Satan? What does it mean, the image of God? Well, the image, if you have a good artist or a good sculptor, the image should look just like the original, shouldn't it? Are you saying God has a head, two arms, two legs? and? Well, now you're going to put me on, on, on the spot. <laughs> apparently, Christ did when he was here on this earth, and he was God. He has apparently retained his human form how different the Father is, how different the Holy Spirit is, we just don't know. Are we supposed to be the image of God in His character? Of course. But that maybe, would be ideal. But maybe not His body? I, I doubt that we'll find God is just exactly like us. Well, there are four existential questions. Questions that deal with the very basic factors of our existence. That's what an existential question is. That have challenged the thinking of human beings from ancient times. Let's look at those four questions. One, where did we come from? Two, where are we going after we die? Three, why are we here? And four, how do we accomplish the best good in this life while we're here? And where, do we, where are we supposed to look for answers to these challenging questions? Well, Scripture, God's letter to us, we call it the Bible, gives us the only authoritative answer to these questions. We did not just happen. We were designed by a divine creator, and we were intended to become like him, or if you prefer, like them. Let us make man in our image. Well, in an effort to, to escape the overbearing and repressive church of the Dark Ages, thinkers sought to find some other explanation for the existential questions. They did not want to believe that they were ultimately responsible to a God who would bring them into judgment and burn them forever in hell. Yet, there are Bible verses that said God is going to bring everything into judgment. Look at Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. After all this, there's only one thing to say. This is Solomon's final words. Have reverence for God and obey His commands because this is all that human beings were created for. God is going to judge everything we do, whether good or bad, even things done in secret. Okay, so that sounds like God's pretty much aware, doesn't it? And if we go all the way over to the end of the Bible, in Revelation chapter 20 we read, And I saw the dead, great and small alike, standing before the throne, Books were opened, and then another book was opened, the Book of the Living. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. Then the sea gave up its dead. Death and the world of the dead also gave up the dead they held. And all were judged according to what they had done. So, it, there's no question about the fact that the Bible makes it pretty clear that we're judged by what? What, what we've done. What we have done. Does God judge on a curve? <laughs> uh, I think you better ask him that question. <laughs> it sounds like 
religion. That sounds like a works-based religion. Yeah, that's interesting because we, we, the other verses say we're saved by faith, but then these verses clearly say we're judged by works. So how can that be? Is that contradiction? Sure seems to be. Seems to be. Seems like if you're saved by faith, you would not be judged at all. How, what good is it going to do to judge me by my works if I understand that, you know, I really don't have much of a character based on works that's worth saving? Mm. If, you know, if I'm going to be based on my works, um, boy, it's going to be pretty slim pickings. <laughs> You're told I hope that not. works is dead, so it's obviously a combination. Yeah. Yes, exactly. What the Bible seems to be saying is, yes, we're saved by faith, but God expects that faith to be manifest in some kind of works. So there's power in this faith? Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's that parable where uh, a person who was given one talent was supposed to um, use it in the pr and two talents and three talents, and to the one who has more, more will be given. So you're responsible for developing your talents. Mm hmm Yeah. Well, how responsible am I? And how many talents do I have to develop? Well, not a question of how many <clears throat> talents do you have to develop. The question is what, what talents has God given you and how are you using them? That's the question. And... I've got to have, I have to have faith in order to, to, so if I'm saved by my faith and my faith empowers me God. to do better works, then I'm, I'm going to be saved by my works because my faith is going to make my works real good. Hopefully. If, that if, 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 if it works out like that. And you were named Teacher of the Year, so your faith propelled you to good works. Well, I think somebody's works there were... A little askew, but <laughs> <laughs> if saved means heal, yeah. and God is, He says, "I'm your healer." Mm -hmm. uh, you don't heal yourself. You don't save yourself. Well, it, I take that back. In Ezekiel 18, it says, "If you stop doing the bad things, you're going to save yourself." Mm -hmm. and so uh, it, they've got the, kind of the opposites we've got to well, deal with. You know, I, I, I don't think. Um, I'm glad you kind of brought that up. I don't think we mention. You know, we, we say, let's say we're saved by, by faith and we look at our lives and we see all the terrible things that we've done and the message is that it doesn't make any, ter make any difference how bad you've done. I mean, you have done things and there's no way to turn those things around. Mm -hmm. No way to redo them. Mm -hmm. um, and yet God can handle the sin after, you know, after it's been. But we never hear anything about faith being able to help us control sin before it happens. It, to well, help us it to, does. Well, I don't hear very many preachers talk about it. Oh, no, I, I agree <laughs> with that. Well, I don't need to tell any of you that the big, the two main elephants in the room in terms of origins are special creation, uh, God speaking and making us, versus evolution, which of course is a long process taking millions of years in which the small organisms become bigger and more sophisticated and so forth. Well, um, one way of dealing with that conflict was an interesting story I heard from a friend. Many years ago, a young teenager living in Los Angeles became interested in the game of soccer. Few Americans knew about or cared about soccer at that point in time. Near where he lived on the campus of the University of California in Los Angeles, soccer was played on Sunday afternoons. He always made sure that he was there to watch the games. In fact, he arrived early. A professor from UCLA, a doctor whose specialty was the history of science, also was interested in soccer. The two of them sat on the bleachers and fell into conversation. And this went on for weeks and weeks. After weeks of discussing back and forth the merits of evolution versus creation, the young teenager on one Sunday afternoon thought of a different approach. He said to the history professor, since neither of us was there when everything began, and since you will not accept the biblical record as authoritative from someone who was there, let's move to the other end of history, our end of history, and talk about us now. 
Let us suppose that evolution is the correct explanation for our origin, origins. That is, suppose that from that day until this, progress has been made by the strong dominating the weak and by the destruction of weaker beings with no thought of any moral implications and everything else that Darwinian evolution implies. By contrast, let us consider a society in which God created us to be his children, with all of us loving each other and loving him. Then the teenager turned to the history professor and said, which of those two societies would you rather live in? The history professor thought for a moment and said, you got me. Hmm. And I think if we put it in those terms, it may not so satisfy the people who want to keep going back and back and back, but it might help some of the rest of us to think more clearly about what the issues are. If society came about through a long line of developing single-celled organisms which eventually developed into amphibians and then into fish and birds and next into mammals and eventually into man, then human beings must chart their course into the future. By contrast, God carefully designed human beings with a plan that they should grow to be more and more like him. He created us male and female, each with a different set of dominant characteristics. Men are men, women are women. He created us that way so that in a truly Christian marriage relationship, we could learn from each other and thus become truly more like God. Men learning from women, women learning from men. Creation was not a haphazard chance event. And it's God's plan that that learning, that growing, that becoming should go on, continue to go on every day. But if we developed out of nothing, we might be able to decide our own course of action without reference to a divine being who will someday judge us for what we have done. But then we also must accept as fact that there, if that's the case, there is nothing beyond this life. Let me ask you a question. Just a little bit aside. We all believe, in this room at least, that Christ came and lived and died some 2,000 years ago. What would be the purpose of his coming and living and dying if he didn't ever plan to come back and judge us and do all the things we think are going to happen in the second and third comings? Would, would Christ have come and done what he did if there was no future for us? No. would be a waste, wouldn't it? Well, the people who say that there is no future for us don't believe Christ came in the first place. Well, in a way... <clears throat> I'm going to comment about that in a moment, but okay. go ahead, Jay. In a way, to a degree, um, there was no future for us had he not, had he not come. You know, that's one of the one of the real problems with the evolutionary approach f f that gives me a, a problem is that I mean from the very outset it seems like they're at loggerheads. The the Bible seems to start out that man is created perfect, sin enters, and things start downhill, and God has to step in to keep the whole thing from just you know coming to one big suffering mm -hmm. end, mm -hmm. whereas at least contemporary evolutionary approach as things began in an inferior uh, situation and and get better and better and better now they say well we've got to watch ourselves or we'll destroy ourselves after all this magnificent evolution but we just get better you know better and better and you know it, it, so that if if the evolutionary the traditional evolutionary theory is correct then it kind of nullifies everything that at least the Christian thought in here in this book, the reason why Jesus came and and so on and so forth. Um, you don't think Lucifer figured problem. that out? He's well, <laughs> the promulgator. Yeah. Mm. Well, it's interesting, very interesting to me. It always is amusing and I chuckle when it happens. How do we explain the fact that while the mass media in this country and the scientific community constantly promote the idea that we develop completely by chance without any supernatural intervention, yet at the same time, when there's some kind of a natural or man-made disaster, what do we hear? 
The media mm -hmm. immediately says we all should pray to God to help us resolve the problem, right? And the insurance company blames it on God. <laughs> or they call the disaster an act of God. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> wow. How do we put that together? Well, you know, if you, if you acknowledge that, that there is a God and, and that you have a relationship to that God, then you have to do something about it. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a Peter Marshall said, if God, if God exists, he's the most important of all that exists. And, and that's, uh, in a way, that's kind of scary because that means you've got to muster your faith and get busy about those works. Yeah. <laughs> I see. <laughs> you remind me of another statement that I remember reading from my youth, which was, of course, many years ago. Take one look at me. Uh, it said something like this, money isn't everything. You know, we sometimes mm -hmm. say that. But then it goes on to say, but it's way, of wha way ahead of whatever's in second place. Right, yeah. <laughs> well, Going on, let's, let's look at some of the biblical ev evidence. Look at Jude. You remember that little tiny book that's right before the book of Revelation? Jude, the verse, there's only one chapter. Look at verse 14. It was Enoch, the seventh direct descendant from Adam. That's very specific, isn't it? Who long ago prophesied this about them. The Lord will come with many thousands of his holy angels, etc. Okay? To bring, very specific. To bring judgment on all. Yes. Well, look at Romans 5, starting with verse 12. Sin, sin came into this world to one man, and his sin brought death with it. As a result, death is spread to the whole human race because everyone has sinned. There was sin in the world before the law was given, but where there is no law, no account is kept of sins. But from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, death ruled over the whole human race, even over those who did not sin in the same way as that Adam did when he disobeyed God's command. I mean, does Paul, the writer of these verses, sound like he has any questions about the existence of Adam or Moses? Not at all. Adam was the figure of the one who was to come, but the two are not the same because God's free gift is not like Adam's sin. It is true that many people died because of the sin of that one man, but God's grace is much greater, and so is his free gift to so many people through the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ. And there is a difference between God's gift and the sin of one man. After the one sin, came the judgment of guilty. But after many sins, so many sins, comes the undeserved gift of not guilty. It is true that through the sin of one man, death began to rule because of that one man. But how much greater is the result of what was done by the one man, Jesus Christ? All who receive God's abundance, abundant grace are, and are freely put right with him will rule in life through Christ and, and, and so forth. Well, now, if, if the evolutionary approach is, is the correct approach, then it pretty well makes null and void not only this theology, but, but that part of this book, those pages of this book. Well, the, of course, the problem is there wouldn't be this book if the evolution of your story is correct. Well, but, no, that's what I'm saying. If, if we use that approach, then... And you kind of have to begin to abandon this book. Yeah. Well, they have. Yeah. Well, one more passage. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 22. But the truth is that Christ has been raised from death as a guarantee that those who sleep in death will also be raised. For just as death came by means of a man, in the same way the rising from death comes by means of a man. For just as all people die because of their union with Adam, in the same way, all will be raised to life because of their union with Christ. So what do we see in those three verses? And many other texts could be cited as well for, as evidence for the fact that throughout Scripture, the prophets and apostles do not try to explain creation, but simply accept it as a historical fact. Is that naive? And I ask you, is it naive to take the Scriptures at face value. I think it can be if I see. if you if you if you if you don't really read them and study them. If you okay. if you just take it 
you know, lightly. Mm -hmm. You don't explore this book, and as we explored in our last lesson, study this book, then in a sense, it, it's kind of a naive, it's kind of a naive approach. Okay. Isn't, isn't there a story about someone who memorized the whole Bible and, and different books, but didn't understand what it said? There's some prisoner that was locked away, and he, I, maybe I'm dreaming something. Mm -hmm. But I, the, the I thought it was is. One of the dictators that memorized large, large portions of the Bible it may have even been, I don't remember who it was. Mm -hmm. But didn't understand what the Bible was saying. Yeah, yeah, they knew it all. You know, I guess, I guess what I'm saying, Ken, is that it is possible to be, to read it and be naive, but if you believe it, you're not naive. Okay, so the question is, why do so many scholars, even Bible scholars, regard the story of Adam, in fact, all of Genesis 1 through 11, as nothing more than mythical events wrapped in undiscoverable ancient mystery and which are nothing more than symbols of ideas or events of which we cannot prove anything? Well, I think yeah. that would be, that might depend on the opinion of the person. My, my opinion is, is I mean, if you take that for what it says, mm -hmm. then it places uh, you in an environment that you may not, a spiritual environment or a knowledge environment or an environment of responsibility that you just as soon shun. What is naive? Do we have that option? Well, I don't think so. Okay. Because I'm one that... that, that believes it. Believes it. and. You know, and you know, probably if they were real serious with it themselves, they would say, you know, it's it's not a smart thing to do either, because they'd okay. be recognizing why they're mm -hmm. why they're shunning it. But Joanne, what I think is naive is people who um, invent, uh, use the cafeteria plan by uh, get a little of this and a little of that. They believe in evolution, mm -hmm. but then they also believe that they have this a God in them that the minute they die they have immortality mm -hmm. and they're going to go someplace that they don't know where they're going to go but they have sort of thought about it in their mind and they sort of make up these but they refuse to read the Bible and uh, and the Bible um, provides so much evidence but anyway and by doing that they sort of avoid hard things if we are created we have a creator Mm -hmm. Where if we're evolved, we don't really have a creator, so we don't have to bother about someone over us. And if we have natural immortality, where we're going to live forever, uh, we don't have to worry about a judgment and that permanent death and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. So people pick and choose, yes. and they don't want to face reality, and so they sort of invent their own imagin imaginatory God uh, they decide what their God is, and um, they imagine their own heaven, and uh, and then they've sort of come to an agreement and sort of crystallized it, and I think it's called like humanism and that sort of thing, and they say, you know, we've really got it, and uh, we've written our own thing, and well, I think you know. I think some people are. I I can see how some people would be sincerely honest. Um, some of it is difficult, I mean, if you're new to this, mm -hmm. if you're coming from, you've had no exposure to this or very little exposure to it, and then you, you encounter it, um, you know, the human mind has to, it has to come to a conclusion, it has to come to some kind of a conviction, a rational conviction in its own mind about whatever reality mm -hmm. it is. So I can see how people would would read this and and uh, it'd be a struggle for them to take it. But the more they read it, I think, the more they dwell upon, the more they think about it. And you know, uh -huh. I think even us here, I think we would be able to say ourselves, you know, we've read this quite a bit, but every time we go back to it, okay. we learn more. Uh, there are things that we, that we, and it's more than just 
seeing some it's it's a, it's a realization mm -hmm. it's a it's a certain deeper wonder, understanding about the whole time? you know you learn more about about what God is like for I, I had a friend um, ask me he said when did the Bible start to be not become the standard of what people of standard for people mm -hmm. when did the Bible not become the standard and I think for maybe a majority of the percentage of our world or maybe in the United States the Bible is not the authority where it used to be mm -hmm. unquestioned that it was the authority mm -hmm. I, I think the Bible doesn't become the standard when it becomes a threat to us it gets in our way mm. that's what I think mm -hmm. I don't for individuals and for a culture as well I don't think it's any more naive to believe in the Bible than it is into evolution, particularly now that there are a few more and more at the time mm -hmm. admitting evolution is admitting there's some holes in the argument. Mm -hmm. and most people, my per life experience that poo-poo the Bible, do it out of stone ignorance. Mm -hmm. So, Let's read again just to remind ourselves the verses in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Then God said, and now we will make human beings. They will be like us and resemble us. They will have power over the fish, the birds, and all the animals, domestic and wild, large and small. So God created human beings, <clears throat> making them to be like himself. He created them male and female. Now, is there any part of that that's difficult to understand or maybe m m easy Pardon. to misinterpret? Well, it is when you look around and, yeah. you know, when the tiger is out there, you don't seem to have control over it. You're ready to run. Well, another thing that is getting misinterpreted today is people refuse to believe that God created male and female. Mm -hmm. Female decide they want to be male and male decide they want to be female. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, to think that God created you one way, like he creates a rose or he creates a lily. You never see a lily wanting to be a rose or a rose mm -hmm. wanting to be a lily. But um, so we're beginning to even rebel at that. Well, God obviously intended, us for us, intended for us to live in loving relationships between ourselves and to care in a loving way for the other creatures and even the, as you said, the flowers and so forth around us, uh, all parts of creation. That seems to be what God intended. Uh, look what Jesus himself said in Mark 12. And you remember some Pharisees and some members, and I'm, I'm reading from the Good News Translation again, Mark 12, starting with verse 13. Some Pharisees and some members of Herod's party were sent to Jesus to trap him with questions. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you tell the truth without worrying about what people think. You pay no attention to anyone's status, but teach the truth about God's will for people. Tell us, is it against our law to pay taxes to the Roman emperor? Should we pay them or not? Now, what were they trying to do? Trying to trick him. To do what? Give authority to the civil. To say not to pay your taxes. Yeah. Well, if he said, don't pay your taxes, then they would accuse him to who? The Romans. The Roman authorities. If he said, pay your taxes, then what are they going to do? What a bad God. They're going to say, you know, this guy is trying to support the Roman government. He, he doesn't believe in the Jewish ideas anymore. So what did Jesus say? Jesus saw through their trick and answered, why are you trying to trap me? Bring a silver coin and let me see it. They brought him one and he asked, Whose face and name are these? The emperor's, they answered. So Jesus said, well then, pay the emperor what belongs to the emperor and pay God what belongs to God. And they were amazed at Jesus, and they should have been. <laughs> well, you know, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have a relationship where they're constantly serving uh, other, each other and humble and not bragging about themselves. Mm -hmm. They don't have Facebook pages. They just talk about each don't other. They don't, they don't talk about themselves. And you told a story, and I don't know if you have time to tell it, about what heaven is like. And I think it tells what kind of people we should be here on earth. And it was about the spoons and people yeah. 
Yeah, so I don't know if you have time for that story, but maybe you could put it on your website if people want to. Maybe I can tell it very quickly. The story is, and of course this is a apocryphal story, but the story is that a man dies and he goes to the pearly gates and there's St. Peter and St. Peter says, would you like to do anything before you enter here? Because once you enter here, you're here permanently. And the man says, well, I've always kind of wondered what it's like at that other place, the place where the bad people go. And God says, well, uh, Peter, St. Peter says, I'm sorry. Well, we can arrange that. Let me, let me find an angel, calls an angel over and says, Could, this guy wants to have a look down there to see what the other place is like. So the angel takes him and off they go and he get down there to hell and everybody is skin and bones. They look awful, awful, awful and they just, you know, like they're about to fall apart, etc. And while they're standing there and looking at these awful people, they hear this bell ring. And the man says to the angel, well, what was that? He says, that's the dinner bell. He says, man, the dinner bell? I mean, these people look like they haven't eaten anything for years. And the angel says, well, come and look. And so they walked down, and everybody was rushing toward this long, long, long building. And there were just a couple doors, and there were people standing outside of each of these doors to go in. And when you came up in line, the angel would say, put out your arms. And you put out your arms like this, and they put cylindrical things around both elbows. And so everybody went inside and sat down and there was this gorgeous table set out with the most luscious food, beautiful fresh fruits and vegetables and so forth and everything else your heart could possibly desire. And everybody's going and pretty soon the bell rings again and nobody's had anything to eat and they have to go back out and they take the things off their arms again and nobody's had anything to eat. And so the man says, Look, get me out of here, that was awful. And so they go back and they go into the pearly gates and as the man is, the angel is sort of showing him a little bit around heaven, they hear a bell ringing. And the man says, what was that? Was that the dinner bell? Oh, he says, good, let's go and see. So they went there and here's this long building and just a few doors and there's people standing outside the doors. And guess what they're doing? They're putting tubes on people's arms and they, but everybody looks happy and healthy. And so the angel, the man is really puzzled, but now he says, well, he walks up and they put things on his arms and he walks inside and here they are, everybody is sitting down on this long table sitting across from each other and each person is picking up fruit and so forth and feeding the person on the other side of the table, mm -hmm. which really illustrates the difference between the kind of people who go in those two places, isn't it? And, and if we serve each other, we are fed ourselves. Yeah. I think that is such a wonderful um, principle. Well, coming back to the Jesus parable in Mark 12, one Christian scholar said, give your money to Caesar, it has his image on it, and thus it belongs to him. But give yourselves to God. <coughs> you bear his image, and you belong to him. That was Miller J. Er Erickson. Christian theology and so forth. Well, are we acting? Are we truly acting like we really belong to God? Oh, sometimes. Sometimes. Most times not. <laughs> Even that, okay. it's pretty puny. <clears throat> Ellen White told us that in the third coming of Jesus, there will be a giant panorama shown in the sky reviewing the truth about the events in the history of sin and the plan of salvation. You can read about that in her writings, Volume 4, The Spirit of Prophecy, page 481, Great Controversy, page 666, and Story of Redemption, page 423. Try to imagine what it was like when Adam and then Eve were first created. What was that first Sabbath like? How was it celebrated? How did Adam, and under the inspiration of God, name all the animals in one afternoon? Did he just name the large animal groups? Or did he get into more detail? We, of course, don't know. How did he pick out those names? How would he have categorized the animals? The only knowledge he could have possibly had at that point in time was knowledge that God had given him. And his with his perfect memory, Adam knew each of the animals from that time on. We don't even know what language he was using. So during this panorama, everybody is going to see our lives, what we have done, well, everybody's going to see at least the big picture. The whole, the big picture, what happens in the great controversy from beginning all the way through to the end. Good, they can edit me out. 
<laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think that's the way it works. Well, human beings discovered that there were no other creature. well, Adam discovered, I'm sorry, that there was no other creature exactly like himself. And so we read Genesis 2, 20 through 25. So the man named all the birds and all the animals, but not one of them was a suitable companion to him, to help him. Then the Lord God made the man fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the flesh. The perfect surgeon, right? He formed a woman out of the rib and brought her to him. Then the man said, at last, here is one of my own kind, born taken from my bone, flesh from my flesh, woman is her name, because she was taken out of man. And some people would try to argue, some uh, very chauvinistic men, that that's proof that men should always be dominant because they came first, they, and women were taken out of man, and I would reassure those men that to remember that every man since that day has been taken out of woman. <laughs> <laughs> well, clearly God had many different ways in which he could have made a companion for Adam. He could have made her in the same way he made him. But God made her from a rib of Adam to teach both of them and us that the entire human race is descended from a single human body. One human body. We were intended to live in relationships. We were intended to love each other, to care about each other and to depend on each other as we live and work together. This should have been our first line of defense against the terrible evil of selfishness and its awful, awful results down through history. Well, the Bible talks about that. Look at Genesis 1.27. So God created human beings, making them to be like himself. He created them male and female. Then look at chapter 3, verse 20. Genesis 3, verse 20. Adam named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all human beings. And finally, Acts 17, 26. From one human being, he created all races on earth and made them live throughout the whole earth. He himself fixed beforehand the exact time and the limits of the places where they would live. So it sounds like God was pretty much in control, wasn't he? He pretty much did it exactly the way he wanted to do it. And he did it in a way that was meant to, to, to extend to us maximum meaning to our lives. Well, by contrast, if we accept some form of the evolutionary model, then we have a hard time trying to explain where sin came from. If we came about by chance, what makes one kind of action good and another kind of action evil? Well, they don't think they're sin or good or... My point exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no real sin. Nothing's really wrong. If, I mean, if I got here because someone in my past was more powerful than his neighbor and decided that he wanted to take the neighbor's wife or whatever, well, that's fine. Well, if evolution and survival of the fittest, or more accurately, survival of those who survived, is the explanation for where we came from, then violence, selfishness, and dominance of the strong over the weaker pre preceded the idea of sin, and perhaps by millions of years. Does that mean that death actually precedes sin? Preceded sin? This is what's sad about religious people that try to combine um, theories, and that they take that the earth, the days were not literal days and they were mm. long days, and that there were, was death in nature before Adam and Eve were created. It, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's amazing. I've tried to pin my friends down to explain about <laughs> sin and why, uh, then why Jesus had to come, and they refused to talk about it. No. Um, but well, what would be the purpose of the plan of salvation if God does not exist? And if there never will be any supernatural intervention in this human history? What would be the point? Saving, saving us for what? For more of this earth? I suppose you might live a healthy life so you could live as long as possible in this corrupt, corrupt age, huh? 
Well, there's more to this creation than just God created them and flipped some switches. Mm -hmm. And so they just kind of puttered around on their own and so on and so forth. It's my understanding that um, that we are c continually dependent. God is it's kind of a life source for us. And, and that's really what sin is, is when we take actions or, or whatever that causes us to separate ourselves from, from mm -hmm. God, then, then that's what really what causes our, our ultimate death, so to speak, is that we have done things which separate us from God or our life source. And we are so dependent on that uh, that, you know, if something were to happen to God, that he would see that God would cease to exist then we would cease to exist. All that we know would cease to exist. The table would cease to exist. The Bible that's by book would cease to exist. My pen, my paper, my, the buttons on my shirt. Because everything is dependent on, on God. That okay. would be my understanding. So to, I don't know, to say this thing popped up all by itself, it's, it, it's really, to me, it just runs absolutely counter to everything that's in ultimately right it's just going to do away with this and and as you said uh, uh, once before well maybe that's exactly what Satan wants yeah well look at 1st Corinthians 15 26 the last enemy to be defeated will be death okay now how does natural selection take place death death you have to have death to survive death of someone else. Mm -hmm. So how can death be the last enemy if it was part of God's original plan in developing a human race or if we just came about by chance and natural selection? I mean, whether you make, some people want to do a theistic evolution. Nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> you have a terrible picture of God if, that's, if, the, if you subscribe to that. Mm -hmm. how, how is that, Jim? Well, this, it, like, uh, Joanne mentioned a few minutes earlier, thousands of years uh, for, for a day, and you know, all this death and uh, the animals and the dying and carrying on, and just uh, and it finally evolved to human nature. Well, you know, with evolution, death is a blessing because death creates stronger species. In God's Maybe. eye, death is the the last enemy to be conquered. So in evolution, death is a good thing for purging. And like Hitler tried to purge our world of what, who he thought mm -hmm. was not fit. And in God's eye, every, every, even the sparrow is precious, mm -hmm. and God does not like to see death. So the two theories are completely separate. Diametrically opposed, I would call it. Read Paul's comments in Romans 5. We already look at Romans 5, 12 to 19, Colossians 3, 10. Look at that. And have put on the new self. And let me just back up verse 9. Do not lie to one another, for you have taken off the old self with its habits and have put on the new self. This is the new being which God, its creator, is constantly renewing in his own image in order to bring you to a full knowledge of himself. God is trying to do what? Constantly renew us, build us up into His image. We certainly could not call these, on, these comments inspired if they do not represent the truth. Ellen White spoke about a curse that came on the human race as a result of three events. What were those three events? Adam's fall, first sin and fall, Cain's murder of Abel, and finally the terrible deterioration into almost total depravity that led to the flood. Could the people today, well, p could the people who lived before the flood have been more evil than the world is today? Do you think they were really more evil back then than we are now? Hard to imagine. Hard to imagine. But you read some of the stories in the Old Testament. There's some... <laughs> Pretty wild ones there, huh? Mm -hmm. Well, fortunately, the Bible does not just talk about our fall and deterioration. Romans 8, 29, 1 Corinthians 3, 18, and Ephesians 4, 23, and 24. Show us that in his foreknowledge, God knew what would happen when we sinned. 
And before we'd even done that, before we had, the first sin had happened, he had put in, a pl in place a plan whereby we could not only recover from sin, but go into the image of our older brother. And who's, what's his name? Jesus. Jesus Christ. I think what's important to remember, and um, people can um, drive themselves crazy trying to improve themselves, and I think that's what humankind does. They try to improve themselves, and you mm -hmm. fail and fail and fail again. The only one who can improve you, and um, like you say, salvation is like a salve, uh, a healing, is God. Mm -hmm. He's the only one that knows what you were made to be and how you can get uh, to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, human beings were designed so that we can become like what we focus on and think about every day. That's, of course, a restatement of Great Controversy, page 555. So by coming and showing us the kind of lives we should live and answering the questions in the Great Controversy, Jesus Christ has made it possible for us to be restored to a right relationship with God. He has defeated Satan's claims against God. So what should be our daily mission and task? Every morning we can be renewed into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Otherwise, Satan will find his way into our environment and our lives and wreak havoc. Now let's talk about that for a moment. We live in a generation where everybody, it seems sometimes that the only thing people really care about is feeling good. I have patients coming to me every day, spending hours of my time and hours of their time and what do they want? They want their pain to be gone. They want to feel good all the time. They don't want any problems. They want to be able to eat whatever they want to eat without having to worry about what the implications are. And on and on and on it goes. Okay? So, Satan knows that such people, and I'm not pointing any fingers or mentioning any names, but Satan is realizing that if he can get people to the point where they are dependent upon certain external things, medications, food, music, da 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 da, you think of the list. Self-indulgence, selfishness. Right. Uh -huh. Take your pick. If he, if he can get people depending upon those things, he will figure out how to manipulate our environment so in effect he will control us by manipulating the environment. And the question is, is that, would that officially qualify as demon possession? I saw a book author talk on TV, book TV, about the medication generation mm -hmm. and how these children who have been medicated since their childhood for overactivity or whatever, mm -hmm. they decided to become medicated through teenage years to, um, because they went through a little trauma and they didn't want to go through it and are now in their 20s and something and trying to think uh, they don't know themselves they don't know how they are without medication mm -hmm. and they don't know if they can survive without medication yeah, so now they're in a they're in a dilemma they have been medicated since childhood and um, ask, ask that question again that you, you asked about would that qualify as demon possession yeah. or what what I mean if if you know, we, we think about the demon-possessed people in Jesus' day. We read about them in the Bible. And usually that, I mean, what does that envision in your mind? It envisions in my mind that, you know, some kind of evil personality, is an, an angel or whatever, has actually come in and lives inside of my body and tells me what to do and controls me, right? Like Satan did with a snake. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the demon is the drug coming in your well, mind and controlling you. But what if Satan is not now inside our bodies per se, maybe he never was, but he has a whole collection of things, whether it's drugs or whether it's music or whether it's, and I'm not trying to point any particular thing, but a whole variety of things that people depend upon for their good feelings, and Satan just is back behind the stage pulling the strings, controlling exactly how we respond to those things. Well, I would certainly, folks, and that kind of a situation would be um, under his control, but I think ultimately um, 
that's if he can get the chance, he will use those things. But he would he would eventually come in and inhabit uh, in a in a possessive way whatever that entails. He would like absolute con complete control of those people, so they can't think for themselves. Yeah. They can't pray for themselves. Yeah. I, th I think it's a question of degree. <coughs> One leads to the other. If you leave, li live a dissolute life to the point where you've allowed your mind or you've actively destroyed your mind, mm -hmm. somebody who spent a life on amphetamines, for instance, yeah. nothing's ever going to happen to them, but they end up like walking vegetables. They're the folks that can get possessed by something else. Yeah. You look at Galatians 5, 16 and 17. What I say is this. This is Paul talking. Let the Spirit direct your lives, and you will not satisfy the desires of the human nature. For what our human nature wants is opposed to what the Spirit wants, and what the Spirit wants is opposed to what our human nature wants. These two are enemies, and this means that you cannot do what you want to do. This is where you need to develop spiritual workouts, mm -hmm. and just like you go to a gym, work out your muscles. I think if you discipline yourself to eat right, maybe start eating right good, um, do the things you're supposed to do, step by step you get stronger. So Satan has less and less control and, and um, can manipulate you less and less because you've learned how to take control of what should be good in your life. And so I find that uh, the Adventists to be very strong mm -hmm. uh, and, and becoming a vegan or vegetarian seems to add to their spiritual strength. Well, I, I can see, Ken, people saying about that text that uh, the author was very much under, he was reflecting the culture of the day, the Greek culture of the day, <laughs> because did not, didn't the Greeks believe that, you know, your, your body was, was your, 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 your spirit or your consciousness were kind of trapped in this body, and the body had inclinations to do things the wrong way, but, mm -hmm. you know, you were... You were your body is, doesn't have any inclinations to do things the wrong way? But, your, but your, your, your mind wanted to... That's what was important. That wanted to do things right, and you were constantly at battle with your body. Well, wasn't that a contemporary kind of well, a Greek it, understanding, it, and couldn't people say, oh, the only author here, he's just <laughs> reflecting the Greek culture of the day. Well, I'm sure someone would like to say that. Do you think that Paul, when he wrote in 1 Corinthians 7 about the struggle that he was, I'm sorry, uh, uh, no, Romans 7, do you think he was, he, was, he was talking about some contemporary Greek theory or was he talking about the truth? Well, are the Greeks entirely wrong in their, in no. their, in their, in their uh, approach well, there? We're, we're, we're running out of time. Let me read a couple of things from Ellen White as a kind of a conclusion. The true object of education is to restore the image of God in the soul. In the beginning, God created man in his own likeness. He endowed him with noble qualities. His mind was well balanced and all the powers of his being were harmonious. But the fall and its effects have perverted these gifts. Sin has marred and well nigh obliterated the image of God in man. It was to restore this that the plan of salvation was devised and a life of probation was granted to man. Why was the life of probation granted to man? To restore the image of God, right? To bring him back to the perfection in which he was first created is the great object of life, the object that underlies every other. It is the work of parents and teachers in the education of the youth to cooperate with the divine purpose, and in so doing, they are laborers together with God. 1 Corinthians 3, 9. And that's taken from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 595, paragraph 2. So many people in our day have taken science to be their God. Anything that supposedly is scientific must be true. If that is true, how do we explain the fact that the two most foundational teachings of physics, the quantum theory and general relativity, directly contradict each other? I wouldn't know, but... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> the very idea of progress through evolution is a contradiction of the second law of thermodynamics. Should we, for whatever reason, reject the biblical explanation of the, our origins and pretend to set our own course in the future, 
or should we recognize that a supernatural supreme being is in control of the entire universe and has our best interests at heart? Should our primary motivation be love, fellowship, even brotherhood and sisterhood? Or as far as possible, should we be motivated to dominate everyone else around us? Well, if we recognize that we are created with the intention of becoming more and more like God, then we must accept our God-given responsibilities. We must do our best to resist Satan and his temptations. So how do you personally answer the great existential questions? Or do you choose not to think about them? When you read Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3, how does it make you feel? Here are some comments uh, by one learned scholar. We learn that God stands at the beginning of and behind all things. Pastor and biblical scholar James Montgomery Boyce comments, Grammatically speaking, there is only one subject in all these verses. God himself. Everything else is object. Objects are acted upon. Light, air, water, dry land, vegetation, sun, moon, stars, fish, birds, and animals. All are objects in a creative process where God alone is subject. In these verses, we are told that God saw, eight, verses 4, 10, 12, 18, 21, 25, separated, verses 4, 7, called, verses 5, 8, and 10, made, verses 7, 16, 25, set, verse 17, created, verses 21 and 27, and explained to the man and woman what he had done, verses 28 to 30. Moreover, before that, God spoke, verses 30, I'm sorry, 3, 6, 9, 14, and 20, as a result of which everything else unfolded. That's from Genesis, an expositional commentary. God not only created us to live in a wonderful relationship, a fellowship with himself, but also gave us the Sabbath every week as an opportunity to set aside all our daily responsibilities and focus on that very relationship. Someday, would you like to celebrate a Sabbath like that first one at the beginning of creation? When God recreates the world at the third coming, don't you suppose that we will be able to celebrate our first Sabbath in the new earth much like they did that first Sabbath in the Garden of Eden? Would you like to be there? I can't imagine anything more exciting than to spend a Sabbath with God and to have him just point out all the wonderful reasons why we can rejoice in his creative power and what he's intended for us and what he intends for us in the future. See you next week.